Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to go with our Zoom protocols now, folks. So mute yourself and mute your video for your bandwidth. And uh, runs a tight ship here. I do. I do. This is the, the Mark Jansen show, it turns out. <laughs> so um, first of all, thank you so much for taking your time to join us. Um, how, are, how are you holding up? Uh, it's been an interesting ride, as I'm sure it has been for for everyone. I, uh, as you mentioned, I play in Cincinnati, and I'm actually in Pennsylvania at my parents' house in my bedroom. Um, Is this the childhood bedroom we're in? Yeah. Wow, straight yeah. from the source. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I felt like I, I can't really practice in my apartment in Cincinnati and I also live there alone, and I just started that job. So combination of factors, I decided for my mental health and for being able to continue maintaining any level on the horn that I needed to be able to play consistently without a practice mute in. So I drove over to Pennsylvania, and I'm just sort of hunkered down here. So it's I love interesting. That. <laughs> really smart. Um, before we, I, I have so many questions, um, and we'll Again, we'll try to stick to roughly 80 or 90 minutes today so we can all get out of here. And, um, but first, can you just give everybody a quick spiel about who you are and where you're from and where you went to school and who you studied with along the way and, you know, the sort of standard intro? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I am now. Um, it's a pretty rural area. Um, this is sort of known as Amish country. Uh, and so it's, I mean, it's gorgeous here and I love it. Uh, so when I was going to school, um, I did make the decision to just focus on the horn. I felt like um, if I was going to make it work, that was the only way I was really going to find out if it was going to work. I mean, I loved all my classes in school, I was a, you know, I was a good student and, you know, I thought about pursuing some sciencey things and I just decided there was only one way to find out if I could make the horn work and that was to just do the horn for a while. So I went from beautiful rolling hills farmland of Lancaster to New York City. Um, so I studied at the Juilliard School. Uh, I was there for my undergrad and my master's. Um, so I was with Bill Purvis for my undergrad. Uh, he uh, teaches exclusively at Yale now, so he's no longer at, at Juilliard. Um, and we clicked right away. I love Bill Purvis. We had a great time. Um, and for my, he wanted, you know, he, to push me out of the nest, as it were. Um, so he didn't want me to go to Yale, even though it was free. I thought that was very mean. Uh, so I did end up staying at Juilliard, but I studied with Jen Montone for my master's um, and just sort of falling under the umbrella of who you are. Um, during my master's, we don't have to get too much into this right now, but um, during my master's, my best friend passed away and that was the worst ever. Um, and so that was a very shaping experience in my life just as far as uh refocusing my priorities and what 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 is what i feel is really important in my life um and what is important in life and so it's just a, a totally different perspective that i did not get to choose but that has informed a lot of who i am since then um Do you feel like that moment kind of pushed you more towards your art and made you sort of leave behind some childish ideas about life or? Definitely. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, the sort of the idea of, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. And I kind of, I kind of don't like that idea. What I like to do is say like, that is bad. And this instead of that was bad, but oh, look here, the good stuff that can come from those events does not negate how bad the things are. And a lot of you might be feeling that way right now, looking around what's happening in the world. It's kind of bad. And it's okay to acknowledge that and to not try to turn it into something positive. It can be bad on its own. And you can take things away from that 
instead of but you can take things away from that. Just to me, those semantics totally changed the ball game. So I think anyways. those those ideas can coexist. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from Julie Landsman and she said, Mark, you got a lot of pain, man. And I said, yeah, maybe. And she said, well, you know, when I lost my sister, it was pain. But when I sit down to play moon music, I'm able to bring my mind to that place. And, and that's not making it good, but simply she, she talks about weaponizing your experience. And right. Right. for me, that's been such a crucial way to change the way I think about uh, things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because all of those things that inform who you are can inform your playing. It informs your storytelling. It informs the way that you connect with other human beings. I can connect with people in a different way than I would be able to if that had not happened. So it is. I, I try to use it for good, even though it's just bad. It's just bad. It's bad. Um, the beautiful thing about our art form is that it's about life and that there is a piece of music for every feeling and every emotion that humans have ever felt. Yeah. And so the deeper your experience, like you said, the more able you are to connect with different people and an audience will always be made up of so many disparate elements. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So amazing. Anyways, let's go, let's yeah. go up. But so tell us a little bit about like, I always like to ask that first audition story. So sure. like, what was that moment where you broke through and you knew it? Oh. <laughs> or did you I not? Know, there, yeah. you know, I know I've, I've heard that's that version as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I started taking auditions toward the end of my undergrad. Um, and obviously, you know, with, with life events and with school, I wasn't taking everything under the sun. I wasn't prepared to do that. That would have been a pretty big waste of money. But um, I think the first audition I took, I like carpooled with a bunch of other Juilliard students. And I think they stayed at my house here on the way because uh, we drove down to Richmond and all took some audition together. I didn't advance. I didn't know why. Uh, who knows? Um, but I do remember, actually, I think the first time that I made it to finals was for, um, it was a low horn audition in Rochester. And I just thought that was the most hilarious thing ever because I am not, my natural inclination is more toward high horn and that is what my jobs have entailed mostly. And so I just thought it was really funny that I like fooled them into thinking that I could play low horn really well. But um, so I think, I think at that point I realized it doesn't matter what I think about my playing. <laughs> it matters what they think as far as who gets hired and who doesn't. So even if I think, oh, I fooled them, maybe I actually did it well. Go figure. Um, and so, but honestly, I think the real turning point for me was after I was already in San Antonio. So I started, um, I, uh, okay, I'm just gonna rewind just for a second. So after I finished my master's, I did one year at New England Conservatory, NEC in Boston. Um, it was a two year program. I knew I didn't wanna be in school anymore, but I couldn't think of a better idea of something to do. and. They gave me a full scholarship, so it didn't cost me money to attend the school. Um, so I studied with Gus Sebring for a year. Um, I love Gus, I love Jen, I love Bill, I love all of them so much. Um, and uh, so I decided to leave after a year, which is basically half of the diploma program. Um, I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. So I freelanced in Boston for a couple months, and then I won this job in San Antonio. Um, and I had really amazing colleagues there um, in the horn section in particular, but just everybody was, I mean, it's like, it's a gem of an orchestra. They're so great and such nice people. And I felt so supported there and so able to grow. Um, I mean, they knew that I didn't have a job before. At some point, everyone starts a job having not had a job before. <laughs> um, and they allowed me to grow. Um, and just encourage that by, by example and occasionally by saying like, hey, you're sharp. Um, 
Was that associate? Uh, I was, yeah, I was third associate there, which is a tough That would have been with with Jeff, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and for those students that don't know who that is, Jeff Garza is the former principal horn of the San Antonio Symphony. He's now in the Oregon Symphony, but one of the best horn players around that I feel a lot of folks just don't know who he is, and he is absolutely, like you said, a a gem. Yeah, he's... um... And I, I've told a lot of people this. I was there for about three years, and I think I maybe heard him miss like five notes over the span of three years, <laughs> including and, rehearsals. Okay, people, the man does not miss. <laughs> and as a person, too, I mean, just the, the level of positivity and uplifting yeah. instruction. I mean, I, I've taken maybe five lessons with Jeff. and Oh, great. Jeff, okay. Every time, I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah, he's a really smart dude. Um, yeah, just all around great person. It was like such an honor and a pleasure to work with him. Um, and uh, oh, he's on Music with Master. Awesome. There you go. And, and afterwards, we'll get set up. You should send your stuff to Nate as well and get oh, you sure. set up on the same thing if you're yeah. interested. Definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so I'm in San Antonio now. Okay. San Antonio, and, and you're feeling good. Yeah, well, and so. It was actually some advice that I got from Jeff and from Peter, who's the second horn player there. Incredible, incredible second horn player. That guy is ridiculous. He can play anything at the drop of a hat. High, low, loud, soft, fast, slow, doesn't matter. He can do it. And there would be times where I would just turn and be like, and he's like, what? And I'm like, how did you do that? Um, So they both gave me some advice I, you know, as I was taking some other auditions and just sort of going through that huge growth spurt of being around these amazing people. Um, and so Peter reminded me that, um, you know, because I was busy practicing for the job to, you know, get tenure and, you know, to do my job well, which was a priority for me, um, that when I was taking auditions, I was just going to have to trust myself. And I was like, say what? Uh, uh, and I mean, I really, that somehow really gave me pause. Like, you want me to trust me? What are you talking about? And I realized like, that was an integral part that I was sort of missing. Um, and I continue to work on that and will continue to work on that for the rest of my life, because that is not something that comes naturally to me. And there may be others of you who feel like you're in that boat as well. Oh, yeah, we're going to pin this to the board right now. So when you talk about your uh, development of learning to trust yourself, Mm -hmm. are there some moments that you can share with us that kind of helped you break through the wall? Do you have a good bead on on sort of the mental gymnastics that you were able to achieve? Yeah, um, I can I can try to sort of pin that down. Um, I don't know if I can think of any specific instances per se where oh, a- I had a realization, but I, w- over some time and with some encouragement and with some results that I experienced, I realized that I only feel badly about something that I've played if it went badly because I didn't go for it. And I realized that, and I like, I am a very introverted person. <laughs> I am not someone who wants to be in a spotlight or that anyone even knows that I'm there, frankly. So it's a little bit odd, my career choice and some of the things that I've had to do, okay? But, but what I realized is like, I kind of like to go for it. Just like swing to the fences, just really go for it. And so I, my, my thing is go big and go home because it's not go big or go home. You're going to go home no matter what. <laughs> but it's also just knowing like you'll be able to step away from the stage. The stage is not who you are. Go big. That's the only way to do it. And then you are a complete person regardless of what happens. Um, and so sort of balancing those aspects of realizing like, okay, I'm a valuable human being, even if I miss a note on the horn, allowed me to go for it. Um, and so I felt like those musical experiences were more thrilling 
um, for me and I felt like I was more in tune with the other musicians on the stage with me and I felt like the audience was able to get into it more like I was able to serve the composer and my colleagues and the audience better by doing that um, and it took me a while to get there I yeah not I'm not gonna lie about that that took a while um, because it's pretty against my nature <laughs> Um, you know, uh, I, you know this, of course, but uh, Kyle Sherman and I are uh, best friends since middle school, and he came and uh, did a master class with us last Monday. Um, and I'll just share this quick uh, moment. When you first got the job, Kyle said he called me up and he was like, "Have you heard this girl, Molly Norcross?" Wait, wait. Have you heard Molly? Have you heard this girl? This is a great Kyle impression. I and I was like, like, I was like, no, man. You know, I don't really know anything about her. And he goes man, she is just going for it. He's like, it's so nice. He's like, now I can just go for it at the same time. Yeah. And I think like one of the things that I learned from Mr. Clevenger is that, um, again, a, a mental double backflip, you'll miss less notes when you go for it. Yeah. It's yep. really hard to reconcile in the moment. I want to be so careful, but that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's actually, you bring up another great point. Uh, I love Kyle. I love playing with Kyle. I miss not getting to play with him now. Um, but when, when you go for it, you let other people go for it too. And it just turns into this huge thing that is super exciting or super beautiful, or just like it allows people to, you know, go out on a limo a little bit and try something and they don't have to be afraid. And that, you know, that's very powerful in a group of people. All it takes is one person to really go for it. And then everyone's like, yes. Well, <laughs> and then especially everyone back there, you know, I mean, for right. better or worse, as first horn or first trumpet, we will decide the energy of quite a bit of music because yep. we're loud. Yep. It's true. It's I, will, I will say I also worked a lot on my soft playing when I was in forward. <laughs> it's very valuable. I got yelled at a little bit. Um, you know, David Cooper says they don't pay me the big bucks to play loud. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, there was, you know, some old man violinist, very famous person. I don't remember who it was and I'm embarrassed. So I just will skip over that part, but who at some summer festival he was conducting and like, he was like, horns are you loud? And you know, I was pretty irritated by that. And he, he said, you may win the job playing Einhauden, but you keep it playing Mozart piano concertos. And I was like, what is wrong with you? And then I get into the job and I'm like, hmm, hmm, yep, you got to be able to sort of be the supporting figures and not get in the way. And people really value you when you can do that well. Um, so it's, it sort of covers the full, the full range. You need to be able to just totally put yourself out there and also you need to be able to be completely listening completely absorbed in what's going on around you to affect that in a positive way but without everyone anyone even noticing that you're there and then your mission has been accomplished um that sort of is more my job now um in cincinnati where i'm doing I'm doing acting associate it's a little bit uh confusing but um yeah so i'm i'm playing a lot of concertos not me playing concertos i'm sitting on the stage playing in the orchestra during concertos that other people are playing. <laughs> right, playing 40% 40, 40 of first. Yeah, so it's a lot of staying out of the way. Um, and people are really impressed when you can do that when you play the horn. So don't forget that. <laughs> Again, I think that's the beautiful thing about our instrument is we get to be in your face one minute and then we get to be a woodwind another minute and we yeah. get to be a small pipe on an organ another minute. and just such a breadth of music making opportunities as a horn player. And I know that's why I switched from trumpet to horn when I was very young. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's just kind of keep running here a little bit. Um, we were in Fort Worth it, chronologically, and, and we, we mentioned this at the beginning. Um, I was at a Mahler 5 concert, which some of you will know has probably the most famous trumpet excerpt ever as the very beginning. Bagadadam, bagadadam, bagadadam. But it also has this incredibly difficult 
first horn corno obligato part, which means on top of all of the normal horn section, Molly stood up. Did you stand or not? I did not stand. Did not Miguel stand. just but, had me just, or it wasn't Miguel, it was uh, Bob Spano. He just had me chill out back there. But nonetheless, the first horn stops playing first and begins playing a solo horn part. And again, YouTube, there are a million recordings of all the greats doing this thing on YouTube for you kids. So can you first, can you talk about playing the corno obligato part for Mahler 5? And then maybe yeah. you can kind of bring us into uh, the lights go out and yeah. how you deal with a situation <laughs> like that. It was one of the wildest symphony concerts I've ever been at. And I've been at a lot. <laughs> that one sticks in my mind as well. I, I hope I never forget it. I don't oh. think I will. Unless I forget everything else that I've ever known, and that goes with it, I don't think I will forget it. Um, yeah, so playing Mahler 5 was so exciting. I had played it a number of times before on different parts, but I had never actually played the full principal horn part before. So that was actually my first, my first go at the obligato. Um, and obviously, we had known for like over a year that that concert was going to be happening. So it had sort of been percolating in my mind for quite some time. I was preparing for it, I don't know if months in advance, probably a couple months in advance, I started preparing for it because I basically wanted to feel like I was going to walk out on the stage and not go on autopilot, but to have everything feel so comfortable that I did not have to give it a second thought, that I could listen to what was going on, that I could watch, that I could interact, that I could do those things while being like, that's my next note. Um, so I, I did, a, I, I probably listened to it every day, um, sometimes multiple times a day, just to really get that in my ear. Um, of, of, and in addition to, of course, practicing it on the horn. Um, if you don't know this piece, I mean, it's a little bit of a commitment to listen to because it's pretty long, but it's awesome. It's so great. Please listen to it. Um, <laughs> And second movement. I mean, people wash right past the second movement, and that, that might be the best part, honestly. I, I love the second movement. That has some of my favorite moments in it. Um, and then the third movement is the big corno obligato part. Many times the, the principal horn player will actually come to the front of the stage to play as a soloist, um, which I did not in this case, and that was fine. Um, I did feel very badly, my poor second horn, Reese Farnell, um, uh, there are some bells up portions that are solo horn. Nothing else is happening. And so <laughs> poor kid. I mean, I just, I just played right into his face and I apologize in advance. And he was like, it's fine. I'll just wear an earplug. Um, because I didn't want to be turning around and, and doing that. So I just, just went right in his face, but he was. Listen, guys, Molly will bring it. She can bring it. I mean, loud. The good kind of loud, too, but a lot of it. Yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of sound. It's more sound than I realize sometimes. Um, because once I okay play it. really loud, I was like, what? Um, so I, I try to really have all the extremes available to me. And even just in one of those, ba da 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 like you get to use the full range. So I was going for it. Um, and then the whole fourth movement is strings only. It's the most gorgeous music in the world. And I confess, I cannot listen to it without getting really emotional. So I just sat there and counted to four over and over and over again, because after that movement, you have to play another solo. And you, you know, if you're sitting there sobbing, it's really hard to play a solo suddenly. So I just have to block that whole thing out, which is kind of sad, but that's just, that's just my reality. So anyways, I blocked out the whole fourth movement. It happened. Um, and then you have to come in and lead the way for the, the final movement. Um, it's a thrilling piece. I, I really can't stress enough. Like if you haven't listened to it or you've only listened to it maybe once or twice, give it another listen. It's a great way to spend an afternoon. Um, so you mentioned our- Second movement, very, is that one that went out? The lights went out in the first movement. In the first movement, okay. And I'll, I'll 
I'll, I'll do a dramatic retelling of the story because it really like sticks in my mind very clearly. Um, <laughs> so um, there were a couple things going on that day. One was our principal violist passed away that morning. Um, after a long battle with cancer, she had been fighting it since like a month before I had joined the orchestra. So it was almost four years that she was undergoing treatment. Um, she she's an incredible lady just really like sharp-witted very funny very sarcastic which is right up my alley um just a fantastic musician a fantastic leader all of these things um and obviously we had known that she was in a very bad way but it's still really sad um so you know i get to the hall i couldn't even go inside i just started weeping and Pulled myself together, go inside. So there's there's that element already on top of this. So I'm thinking like, really glad that I prepared for this because there's a lot on my mind right now. And if I didn't know this piece inside and out, we could have a problem. <laughs> um, the first half was um, the Strauss four last songs, some of the most beautiful music of ever. Um, I highly recommend listening to that as well. Um, which I did not play, thank goodness. I just sat in the back and cried and listened to Kelly Cornell, who just nailed it. She sounded amazing. Um, then it was time for Mahler 5. So toward the end of the first movement, there's this, um, it's, I'm, to me, it's like this really pivotal moment and it's really exciting. And as I was like counting my eight measures of rest for that moment, the lights on the stage went completely dark. So there were still some lights like um, going along the balconies uh, in the like in the audience. So like maybe if you were at the very outside of the stage, you could still see your music a little bit, but generally no one could see anything. And <laughs> I had two thoughts. <laughs> one was, I know what my first note is and I know when it is. And my second thought was, please dear Lord, let my assistant have brought his phone on the stage and please let him get it out of his pocket and turn it on and shine the light on my music, <coughs> which he did. Thank you, Jerry. But so the lights went out. He caught me after I had invented a couple of notes, but generally got the thing. I don't think anyone would have known, but so the lights go out and it's like, I have like two bars and I'm like, <laughs> and then bum, ba, 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 be, da, ba. Ba, 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 ba. And I'm just like going crazy. Then Jerry gets the light on my part. I'm still going. Lights are still out. Still going. Then the lights come back on. They were out for 30 seconds. That orchestra did not stop. As an audience member, you know, this is like your worst nightmare as a performer. Yeah. And, you know, I know the piece like the back of my hand. And like you said, I, I mean, sure, were there a couple of chips and misses in that moment? Sure. But as a whole, the orchestra didn't miss a beat. They just, they just cruised right through it. And, you know, by the end, I couldn't even remember that the lights went out. It was so glorious that it was just an incredible thing to be a part of. And knowing what we knew beforehand, and it's not as though it was just you. Of course, you know, you live with these people day in and day out. And it has yeah. a, a massive effect on every single person in the orchestra. So to have everybody playing their heart out and then this happens is like really special. Yeah, it, it was. And, you know, this is another one of those things where it's like, it was really sad that Laura died. And... <laughs> we played our hearts out and, and that really was a very special experience. Her son and her husband were in the audience. Um, so they were part of our family for that. And I mean, it just, it really reminds everyone of why they do this in the first place. Um, and so it was extremely powerful. And I will say Laura's also a huge trickster. And so most people on stage were like, Laura, turn out the lights. She's messing with us. Um, well, and, and truly part of your family. I mean, her son is a trumpet player, very, very good trumpet player, who's a, uh, 
who's a student of Kyle's and and again they're seeing the most massive trumpet piece of all time yeah. essentially yeah yeah so that that was you know as we've said a really powerful and memorable experience um certainly one that i won't forget i mean the other concerts were great we had a great time on friday and saturday but sunday was a different ball game um and it was it was special and awful and great and powerful and terrible and you know it, it was all of those things and that just coming together in that way and that orchestra has been through a lot Okay, we, we went on strike my second year there. Um, you get to know your colleagues really well when you're walking around in circles with a picket sign for a couple hours a day. Um, and quickly for you students who are very, we have some really young kids in here who are sixth grade and up. So what she's talking about yeah. is that you, as an orchestral musician, you are in a union usually. And that union means that together we are stronger than we would be individually. And that allows us to make more money and have better benefits because we negotiate our wages as a group, not individually. And right. so what a strike is, is when all of the musicians say, hey, you guys aren't treating us fairly. And so we're not going to play. And when you start treating us fairly again, we will resume playing. Um, and this is very common in other industries as well, uh, hospitality, hotels, and restaurants, depending on the part of the country. And, um, you know, it's, it's in Texas, unionized labor is not a huge deal. And as musicians, we have the largest professional union in Texas, which is called the AFM, the American Federation of Musicians. Anyways to yeah. educate these young minds. Um, yeah, thank you for, thank you for mentioning that. Um, yeah. When we heard yeah, John yeah. Thurman talk a little bit about the differences of playing in Seattle under a, a very, very different structure up there. Right, yes. Um, but we'll save that for a more uh, in-depth. Yeah, it's, yeah, honestly, it's not that interesting, but the reality was that management was not doing their job very well, and we were unable to continue in that way. Um, and so we were on strike for almost four months. It was not good. Was um, not and actually, fun. during that time, I was then appointed as principal horn in San Antonio because Jeff Garza was out for a year. Um, he was playing in San Francisco. Um, so they appointed me with the understanding that when Fort Worth went back to work, that I would leave. Um, so I, I have now resigned from the San Antonio Symphony two times. <laughs> <laughs> It's not fun in any time. I don't like resigning from things. It's very sad. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I loved my time in San Antonio. I loved my time in Fort Worth. It was absolutely bittersweet to go to this job in Cincinnati, um, which is another great orchestra with great musicians, great people. Um, for me, a big draw was that I'm now able to drive to see my family instead of having to fly or drive for three days and um, vice versa you know they're able to enjoy in in your success which i think is just so important yeah definitely definitely um, so i want to talk shop a little bit before we hear some young horn players sure. um you I'm have really bad at talk. <laughs> you have a very high pressure job um, Mr. Clevenger always described being a first horn player as walking the tightrope. Yeah. And um, so I'd like to talk about how you set yourself up to be consistent and successful each and every day. And so can you walk us through a little bit of the routine elements that you like to begin each day with? And yeah, how sure. do you get going on the horn? And what are those things that really stick out as un- uh, just unmissable. You have to do them to feel great. Yeah, sure. So I have, um, I have a, I, I guess I'll call it a routine. I have a set of exercises that I can sort of mix and match and move around and, and do as I feel I need each day. But I, I hit my fundamentals every day. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there might be days where I, only have an hour and I'm, that whole hour is going to be fundamentals probably like I might not do any actual music playing during that time because I really need to do those fundamental things. Um, so for me, 
what those things are focusing on um, first is just getting some air moving. Uh, I'm someone for whom basically every time I pick up the horn, I feel like I maybe have never played the horn before. And so it takes some time to get back into that. Now, if I've, if I played like eight hours the day before and I pick up the horn, yeah, I'm going to remember how that feels pretty quickly. But it's it, interesting. Joe Ossie said the exact same thing. Okay. Oh, Joe. Yeah. He, he likes a long warm up, and that sometimes he's, he's like, I don't know how though. I don't know how Haley only spends 15 minutes warming up. <laughs> I can do it. And I will specifically practice that sometimes where I will play for five minutes and then dive in because I feel that I need to be prepared to do that. Things happen. Sometimes you don't get to the hall when you thought you were going to get there and you need to be able to jump in and sound good no matter what. So uh, quickly, our students have a pretty good vocabulary around fundamentals, Caruso and path and harmonic series. So don't, don't, you know, you can, you can talk specifics. They'll know what you're okay. talking about. Okay. Very cool. Um, I have to think of some specifics now. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, I, my priority when I have the time and I, and I say, okay, I have an hour and a half, I'm going to go through my fundamentals. Um, getting air moving is the way that I reacquaint myself with the fact that I am a horn player. And because uh, if, if I don't have that ear going, there's no way that my chops are going to feel good, period. So how do you do that? Um, I start out with mid range. Well, so I start out with harmonic series starting in the middle um, and then branching out and out and out so that I'm getting into some lower and higher stuff, uh, sort of gradually moving, moving outward. Um, and I'll do that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through, you know, each, each fingering and then in, in, in one sort of process and then move to the next process, go through each fingering, move to the next process, go through each fingering. It's a little bit redundant. Um, it's a little bit repetitive, but I feel like it helps me to get my mind going in the right place to get my ears listening to what I'm doing and responding, gets my ear going. Those are, you know, those are important things. Um, so it's okay that it's not a thrilling exercise. <laughs> um, and I also like to, this is something I, stole from the fourth horn player in Fort Worth. He'll, you know, play something and then he kind of puts his horn down and kind of like sits around and doesn't do anything for a minute and then he picks up his horn and plays something else. So I stole that from him because it feels really good to be able to leave 10 seconds, 15 seconds in between each is each of these sort of small gentle bursts. Um, and that just, it just feels better. So when I have the time, I like to leave a little bit of time in between while I'm going through that first series. Um, frequently after that, I do some scales um, and I'm covering a large range and I'm mixing scales and arpeggios and slurred and articulated so that I'm getting my tongue in the game just a little bit. Um, I frequently do some more flexibility exercises, especially geared toward low playing. Um, I focus a significant amount of time on low playing because I have to, otherwise it will sound very bad. Um, even though that's not my job and because that's not my job generally. Um, so because when I'm on stage, I'm usually playing in a certain register, I need to spend the time off the stage doing that in order to be a well-rounded horn player to have everything maintained to the level that I want it to be. Um, this will sound a little bit strange, but I do my long tones after I've done those other things. Um, for me, if I start with long tones, I feel like my face gets stuck. And to me, that is not a good feeling. And rather than sitting with a bad feeling and having it sort of gradually get better, I start with something where there's a little more flexibility involved. It just feels better for me figuring out how to play the horn every day. Um, so that's when I get into my long tones. And again, it's sort of a radiating thing where I start, I start on a first line G and migrate out from there. Um, and if I have time and if I'm not going straight into a rehearsal, I will do a significant amount of work with those long tones with, um, doing crescendos and decrescendos. If I have a rehearsal right after that, I'm probably not going to do that because it's really tiring. <laughs> um, and then I'll do 
some Farkas type stuff and that just sort of gets me flowing again and then I can move forward into the other things that I'm going to do. Um, so that sort of is the shape that my, my fundamental work takes. And honestly, like a lot of it is about listening to be aware, aware of what noises are coming out and to be aware of what I am doing to try to make it as efficient as possible. Um, it's, it's really tempting to have it be a mindless thing. And I'm definitely guilty of doing that sometimes. Um, but it's just way more effective when you pay attention. As a <laughs> Two things really stick out to me about what you said. Um, you know, taking short breaks between reps to make sure that you're always approaching things with fresh and able chops and that you're not warming up tired lips, essentially. Yeah. I think that's, that's a crucial part of mine. I always tell my students that, you know, my hour and a half, there's probably 30 minutes of just sitting there built into that. Mm -hmm. much I hate to admit that I mean it's necessary and then yeah. the sort of expanding snake of the range and my students are very familiar with that because we do a flexibility buzzing routine that's okay. identical right. start where you are most comfortable for some kids that's g for others it's c yeah um, and yeah. then just let the harmonic series snake its way open as you warm up and mm -hmm. we heard kevin hazeltine talk about that last friday and oh, awesome. uh, okay. this is not a what i what i'm loving is is all the repetition from all of these great <laughs> players so these students can start to see how much overlap there is coming yeah. from the mountaintop right and and you're getting you're getting some like variety of backgrounds and the people that you're talking with as well so when you're hearing that repetition from people coming from different you know different approaches then you kind of know like hmm well, and I love that you're sitting here talking about studying with Bill Purvis and Jen Montone, and yet a high degree of emphasis on harmonic series, which of course is Mr. Bermulin's bread and butter, who was our first yeah, guest. Yeah, which I didn't, I mean, I know now that that is his deal. Right. I did not know that for a very not long Not your teacher. <laughs> and again, it's just like, this is what I, this, this really was what I was after with these classes is to synthesize these elements and let people understand that they really are just Farkas and Jacobs and we've just retooled them for the modern era. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and I think sort of going along with that idea is the idea that these fundamentals are, are critical and you use them for music. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, they're, they're, they're not very exciting on their own, but when you really have those things nailed down firmly, it means that you can do so much more expression with your playing. Um, and so for me, slogging through the fundamentals, I don't, I don't think it's very fun. I really don't. Um, but I know that it makes me able to do all of the things that, maybe not all the things, more of the things that I want to be able to do that I can imagine or that I've heard other people do and that I want to mimic doing those fundamentals, doing the scales and the long tones and the arpeggios and listening and, 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 you know, correlating with what you're doing with what you're hearing. All, all of these things enable you to then play the amazing music that you want to play. Um, so I, I just want to sort of bring that full circle as well, because I was talking about, you know, going for it and, if you listen to me do my fundamentals routine, you'll probably think I'm a very boring horn player because it's just cut and dry and I'm just, it does not sound expressive at all. But then when I flip the switch and play music, it's because of the fundamentals that you can do things that are captivating and, and exciting and beautiful and interesting and colorful and all that stuff comes from the super boring, annoying fundamentals. <laughs> I got addicted to fundamental playing because the results, you know, you don't like to do it, but when you start to feel it get better and feel yourself be more in control of your expression, it doesn't, it's not hard to sit there and play those fundamentals anymore because you know where it's going to put you. It feels absolutely worth it. The last uh, thing I want to focus on because yeah. you're like the perfect person to talk about this is you are a super active person, much more than me. Uh, you, for, you know, I know Molly a little bit, so I know that she does CrossFit and cycles and runs. Talk about the role that being an active person plays in you feeling able to do your best. I know 
for me, it's, it's crucial. Yeah, I can definitely talk about this. Um, so I, I mean, I, I loved like playing out in the yard and, and gym class and stuff growing up. Like I, I sort of had a natural incli inclination to want to be doing those things. Um, then I went to school and I did not do any of those things because I was practicing all the time. Um, and uh, so it was the idea of just, you know, moving around and having that help you feel better was not something that I really explored again until I was actually in San Antonio and my friends were like, come run a 5k with us. And I was like, I don't think I can actually do that. So that was my starting point was encouragement from my friends and realizing like, wow, this actually makes me feel way better. Um, and so I've, I've never gotten into the CrossFit stuff, but, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, it's okay. I just, I just don't want to mislead anybody. Cause that's a, you know, very sort of particular thing, but I, I do, I like lifting weights. I t take boxing classes in Cincinnati. It's super fun. <laughs> um, and I do run and I cycle and, and I've actually, during last week, um, I really kind of got into a slump where I was not feeling great. And I realized that part of it is because I had stopped, you know, running every couple of days or just doing those kinds of things. So I wrote, actually wrote out a little calendar for myself. Um, and, you know, do I, do I love running every minute that I'm doing it? No. Um, and it took me a long time to love it. And that was when I was preparing to do a half marathon, which was in memory of and raising money for the um, Leukemia Lymphoma Society in memory of my best friend who had passed away. So that is actually what brought me to running, believe it or not. So um, since, and I know that when I start doing those things again, I'm going to feel better. For me, I need to get my heart rate up for like 45 minutes a day, most days a week. And that just really clears out my mental space. And obviously, yes, like physically I feel better, but for me, the benefit that I'm feeling even more importantly right now in these circumstances is that mental benefit. It, it's unmistakable. And when I don't have it, I do miss it. Um, Argus asked if there's any specific things that are horn focused that you do. I know I work my shoulders and my rotator cuffs a lot. Oh, interesting. I, okay. I have an issue with my, with my rotator cuffs. So I have to be really careful with how I hold my horn and what exercise. Yeah. I do. That's a big you one with, with the horn. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, I, what I do try to strive to do is to be strong in every part of my body. And so I think the idea of having just sort of that well-rounded strength helps me in that way. Um, I, I never feel, cause I feel like sometimes you know, injuries can come from an, an imbalance where you've been working really hard on something and something else gets neglected. Now this area is just a very complicated, um, you know, just like the way that muscles attach and just the way that it's structured, the way that the joint works is just a really complicated thing. So just, you know, just being strong isn't necessarily um, going to, to serve every player, you know, just, it's a weird joint and a weird posture that we have to play the instrument. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't think that I have any particular exercises as far as like keeping these areas strengthened, but I am super mindful of how they feel while I'm playing. Um, just noticing if I'm clenching things, I clench in my back when I'm playing really loud because I'm kind of leaning backwards to like really um, get some power, which is not super productive. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I'm, I try to be really aware of my core stability. And so I do focus some of my exercise time on core, but it's not, you know, I'm not doing like a million crunches a day or something. It's part of trying to keep everything strong. So I would suggest in addition to creating stability in the shoulders and in the neck and in the back and core, because those large muscles are going to help support the smaller ones. Some of what has been super helpful for me is actually the Feldenkrais or Alexander technique. Again, it's yes. not as much about strengthening, but about finding and, yeah. and discovering these very at rest postures where 
you're allowing your body to have a lot of structure while not being flexed. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that actually. So I, t I did take Alexander technique. It is a class that you can take at Juilliard. Um, you think the, any student that's interested, I have a, a lady who works with all the DSO horns. And if you want oh, to take a lesson from her, we can set that up. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and so I did that all throughout my time at Juilliard. So for six years, once a week, I was meeting with an Alexander Technique teacher um, with two or three other musician students. They do a lot of work with the um, acting division there, but they do also have some classes for musicians. I know Alex um, Keenly took all those classes yeah. at Juilliard as well. Yeah, he was super into it. Um, yeah, so Alex and I overlapped at Juilliard for five years, so I oh. we go way back. Yeah, I know. Perfect. Yeah, he was, oh, again, he came and talked to us as well, and yeah. obviously Alex is one of my good friends. He actually lives, we moved to Richardson, he lives like two minutes down okay. the street. Walking awesome, there. okay. Yeah, Alex and I were at school together. I overlapped with Danielle a couple years. I overlapped with Joe Ossie one year. So all those guys, I was so happy to, you know, see them on your YouTube channel. I was like... Those guys are awesome. Um, so one of the really interesting experiences I had with Alexander Technique, and this is really pertinent for, for everyone, um, I had my, I think I, it was just a chair turn. So that's where they're working with you while you're sitting to sort of balance out your posture and make sure that, you know, you're not holding things and you, you, can, you can discuss more of sort of what goes into that. Um, but th the important bit is I had my chair turn and then they said, okay, now pick up your horn. Um, so I picked up my horn and because my spine was all nice and elongated, I picked up my horn and I put my belt on my leg and I went, I can't, I can't play because my mouthpiece is on my chin. So that is when I started playing off the leg because, um, I was either going to have to hunch or play off the leg. So I actually used them not interchangeably, but actually as specific tools. There are times where I will deliberately play on my knee, but I will sort of uh, scrunch my toe up and get my heel up higher so that it is actually on my face. Um, and I use that as a tool when I have to play some really soft things or if I'm trying to get more of a covered color, you know, this kind of stuff. But generally I play off the leg now and it was because of that experience in Alexander Technique where I got everything working perfectly and then tried to put the horn in the equation and it did not fit. Um, so, you know, I, some, I, I'm, I'm a very short person, but I have a, a tall torso. So it was, a, you know, it was, it was a discovery <laughs> that uh, even though I'm super short, I can't play on the leg because my torso is too tall, especially if after I do Alexander technique. <laughs> Um, so that's, I think that's that really idea of be, you know, and this is something I try really hard to achieve with, with sixth graders, with the newest kids is to set up your body as a blower and then bring the horn to the blowing. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're in your best blowing posture, then you will play beautifully. But yeah, yeah. It is, you know, I, I want students, I want to, I want to overemphasize here because you hear your band directors all the time say posture, posture, posture. And you go, man, that's stupid. I don't want to do that. But when I, when we talk about core support and we talk about resonance, all of these things are functions of our posture. And mm -hmm. one of the easiest ways to sound bad is to scrunch up and to be small. When, you know, again, if, if uh, I, I love to use David as an example, because he's not a big guy. I mean, for those of you that don't know, David Cooper's about three inches shorter than me. And I've probably got 20 pounds on Dave. I'm not a big guy either. If somebody that small is able to produce this massive sound and you see the emphasis he puts on posture just all the time. Right. So Again, kids, like when you hear it, it's not for nothing. The little things make the big things happen. And if your posture is great, you're going to sound great, period. Yeah, I was uh, <clears throat> berated with many words that I cannot say here for <laughs> sitting with my leg sort of like tucked under my other leg. Jen Montone was having none of it. Uh, uh, Argus. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. 
<laughs> oh, it was, <clears throat> it was colorful and memorable and I never sat like that again. Um, but just to, you know, to tag on with exactly what you were saying about, you know, we are, you got to configure yourself for the best airflow possible. We are professional breathers and professional listeners. That is my job. I breathe and I listen. Um, and so as basic as those things sound, and they are things that you literally do 24 seven without even thinking about it. That's what makes being a musician, especially a brass player, so interesting because you have to think about those things that your body is going to naturally do anyways. And you have to do it in a slightly unnatural way. Um, the way that you listen on stage or the way that you listen to yourself while you're practicing is not just normal listening. The way that you breathe and control your breath when you play is not the same as what you do when you're just, you know, sitting around. So it's, it, that's, I don't know, that's something that makes it so fascinating to me is like, these are normal things that your body does without you even thinking about it. But when you think about it, you can do some really cool stuff. Absolutely. Man, you're just awesome. Um, <laughs> Who's going to play? Let's hear some young horn playing. Yeah. Can I go? We were playing first. Let's turn on your camera and uh, unmute yourself. Oh, we're going to get Laksh in here. Hey, Laksh. Hello. All right. I am going to get out of here and allow you all to, uh, to, to work together uh, for about 10 minutes, 12 minutes or so. And yeah, Molly, right. uh, don't be afraid to uh, get after him, okay? I'll see what I can do. <laughs> oh, fun. Tell us what you're going to play, Lach. Uh I'm going to play the triplet part of Clang 9. Okay. Okay. to say I uh, see your pull-up bar in the back. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> I have one here as well. <laughs> um, yeah, really nice. It took me a second. It's, it's, Kling has uh, not always been a regular part of my life, but I do know this one, so I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, so of course, uh, you know, with the uh, condensed audio with Zoom. Some some things that I'm going to say are going to be in the form of questions because I can't always hear exactly the way that I would if I were sitting in the room. Um, so one thing I want to know is, um, did any any of what you're doing feel um, while you were playing it? Did you feel like you were a little bit tense? A little bit in the end of it, in the poor part. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's, I'm, I'm just gathering information. That's just helpful for me to know since I can't quite tell through the audio all the time. Um, yeah. So it seemed like some, some moments were like, were very resonant and had a really lovely sound. And then there were other moments where that wasn't happening as much, at least as it was coming through to my computer. So I'm just trying to decipher, you know, where those things might've been happening and then maybe why as well. Um, so the, the, the moment that you were talking about sort of toward the end. Um, can you can you play that one more time just so that I can hear it again and sort of try to use the information that you're giving me? Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so what did you feel was, um, I, I'm sensing uh, 
some differences moving between the registers. And again, I'm just trying to gather information so that I, because uh, I'm not exactly sure if it's, you know, like camera, phone, computer, you know, interwebs issues. Um, so are you, do you feel like you're getting a similar sound as you're going lower as you do when you're going higher or is one more comfortable than the other? I think in my low range right now is a little bit uncomfortable. I need to work this part a little more. Okay, okay. Good to know. Um, so this, this is maybe good because low range is not the most comfortable thing for me either. So I yeah. can, um, I can try to, well, first of all, we're like, you know, team low horn is hard, um, which most people are on that team. It's a good team. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it is a really great thing to work on. And I, I actually think playing low horn is super fun. Um, especially when I feel like I'm not just totally making a fool of myself, um, which you are not. Um, but I don't like to feel that I am. Um, so one of the things that I would say is, um, and this is something that we talked about with the way that we warm up, starting with something that is comfortable and then sort of moving outward to things that are less comfortable. So um, something that you could do is like play the super low bits actually an octave higher to feel what what that comfort level is and then try to translate yeah. that same comfortable feeling into a lower register. Um, and I know Danielle, it, I mean, Danielle Coleman is an awesome low player and she mentioned a few things that were super helpful. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna even try to be as helpful as her. Um, but she mentioned something about, um, it's much easier to start with sort of blasting low and that like yeah. that's actually how you sort of build your low register and then you sort of bring it back it's a lot harder to start out playing really softly and then try to generate power after that so it's just sort of like it's almost a, like a backwards approach but i've heard several really awesome low players talk about it that way um so you know when 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 you have a little bit of a little bit of privacy <laughs> you can try to really honk out some of those low notes just to see what like what the variables are in the equation that need to shift in order to get the sound that you know is there in the horn um so it, yeah. some of it is experimentation and i think sometimes trying to put words onto some of those things is less efficient than listening to low horn being done well and then just asking your body to do whatever it needs to do to make that happen for you. Um, so of course there's like, you know, bigger jaw opening, lots of air, support, um, compression. Danielle was talking about that kind of blew my mind. I was like, low horn compression, what? Um, so all of all of those things are are great. And I think I think those things all serve the the bigger idea of making those uncomfortable bits feel related to the comfortable bits. Um, so I get the sense that maybe when you're seeing some of the lower stuff, you're like, I got to play low now. And so then it's getting disconnected from what you were doing before. So if you yeah. can have a sense of like these notes, they're a little bit lower on the page, but it's okay because they are related to what I was just doing. And so trying to have it feel as related as you can, um, even you know i don't know physically what sort of difference that makes maybe it's all just in my head but it works so um so let's just so try just a... um going from maybe sort of the last little phrase in that sequence that's getting higher into the low stuff do you sort of know what i'm talking about yeah no. okay well, actually, it's within what you were just playing one just one quick addition here each yeah, please. That you've played we've had a couple of different clinicians ask you to work on what on my air and breath on your intake on your intake and when you began i didn't see much improvement i need to see those lungs fill a hundred percent and i need to yeah. see that vertical stack <gasps> which again will provide the oral cavity for those low notes if you simply set it That's up true. in your breath. So I, I'm, I'm gonna interject just one quick breathing, two quick breathing things in here because as I said, you know, as foreign players, you, you know, you are a professional listener and a professional breather. So one of those things and 
based on what Mark just said, I'm guessing that this is something you've talked about, but your lungs go up to here. And so when you're really filling, a lot of, like, it's going to expand in all directions, and it will be a little bit up as well. So don't be afraid to allow that to happen naturally. It's not this, but it's from the inside, because your lungs, they really do go up, up this far. It's a little bit crazy. Um, second thing is um, another way to think about sort of the open, efficient intake of air. The most efficient time when your body takes air in is when you're surprised. Um, so if someone jumps out and scares you, you're going to, oh, you are going to get a ton of air, ton of oxygen into your body really quickly. And it's because your body knows exactly what to do, which is to get the back of the tongue out of the way, get it open, get it in there. I mean, with the breath that I just took, I could play for eight measures easily. Um, and so not that I'm saying be startled every time you play the horn, um, but to just sort of think about your body is designed to get air really efficiently and that's the way that it does it is by getting the tongue out of the way and just and it doesn't take long you can take you know a longer sort of uh slower intake but you can get everything you need really quickly so i think um finding a happy place in the middle is most effective for most playing um and for some people they want to have their intake of breath be in the tempo that they're about to play I think that is generally a good idea and also with um, sort of in the style that you're going to play. So for this, it's, you know, sort of a light, uh, a light breath um, versus if I was about to play, you know, Brahms or something, then it would be. And so even just it's, it's, it's another musical act is, is your breath. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for mentioning that. I sometimes, you know, um, unless I hear someone just start to play without even breathing at all, which I don't understand how it's possible. Um, <laughs> so I think, I don't, I don't think you didn't breathe at all, but maybe your breath can help better set up sort of the musical <laughs> that you have in addition to just getting more air in the lungs. So let's give that another whirl. So we've got a good breath indicating sort of the musical style that you're about to do. And then having sort of the the lower and maybe more uncomfortable things feel related to the more comfortable things. So let's let's give that a try. That seems start at the repeat. Start at the repeat. I think that's it. Um, awesome. start from the repeat there and then play through when you finish. Actually, the the very ending was was at another at another level from what we did before. Um, oh, good, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, Holly, you gave me some advice a long time ago about not overblowing my own tongue and corners. And when I hear Lakshas mid low around G there, to me that feels like the same issue. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of, um, I don't know, I feel like things sort of function in, in sort of this golden ratio. And, and so like the amount of work that's happening here is going to be matched by the amount of app, you know, air work happening and support work happening. Um, and so sometimes it's just, it's, it's just a, like the, the, the ratio has just gone slightly off and that, um, affects the resonance. And so I think, I think that might be what you're talking about, that some of those, some of those pitches that you're maybe sort of muscling and not giving the air that they need in order to match the amount of work that's happening to have that really resonant um, resonant ratio. We'll go with that. Um, <laughs> and so I think, I think I would suggest 
um, well, you, you know what, you know what sound you're going for. And I think what's going to need to happen is that the air is just going to need to be moving at a little bit quicker rate. Maybe um, it, it seems like maybe your air is sort of doing this a little bit and if it can just be a little bit more uh, focused um, and that will match sort of the work that you're doing here. Um, uh, just, just see if, if pumping in a little bit more air and having it um, feel focused and not spread at all. I think that will work with the, the musculature that, that you're using, which I think is appropriate for what you're doing in that range. Can you just, can you just try, um, I don't know if you can instruct on a measure number or something, but um, where, where that happens. Yeah, you just wanna, let's just hear that same triplet repeat again, Lach. And what okay. I would really like is for you to play it like about 10 clicks slower. Because the, the triplet sub is, is pretty rough right now, man. Yeah. Smooth it out. Smooth it out at a slightly slower tempo at that repeat. I just pulled this out yesterday because I got a little bit bored of Strauss. <laughs> well, for all of you, and, and again, this is where I'm at. I am playing etudes day in and day out right now. Kling, Gallet, Chantel, Charlier. Just play your old region etudes, kids, seriously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, only, not only to sort of revisit some of these things, um, but also, like, guys, etudes are kind of hilarious. And so... A lot of them are. Some of them are actually really beautiful. And so if you can pretend that they're music or make them music, um, I find that that, it just makes them even more effective than they already were just as etudes, if that makes sense. Um, so I think along with maybe just bringing this tempo back a little bit, I think this etude is really funny. Like, it's just very quirky. So if you can lean into that a little bit, a little bit of the humor that's in there, um, I think that will also eliminate some of sort of like the technical issues that you might be feeling. Um, and again, that's just sort of the relationship of like the fundamentals to the music is you do the fun fundamentals in order to do the music. And sometimes doing the fundamentals in a musical way makes the fundamentals better. <laughs> um, so yeah, so a little bit slower and with that smoothness where where written, um, but then also to sort of bring out a little bit of the quirkiness in the way that like sort of the harmonic stuff moves around and some of the articulations. It's actually kind of hilarious. So um, Okay, so we'll, just we'll, do it all better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm throwing a lot at you and I appreciate uh, your he's willingness he's, to he's just one take of my, it with a smile. <laughs> Fox is a great player, so um, awesome. emphasize that blue note, man. It's kind of like till, but 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 up, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So let's let's hear that again. Away, slower, dog. Slower, slower. <laughs> job and you know you, again man it's like what's stopping you from doing that five times and then clicking it up five beats and then five more times that's where the practicing is it's mm -hmm. slower man yeah yeah slow practice um is something that i uh ex i extol the virtues of slow practice to anyone who will listen um i think it's very important <laughs> So great job, man. Um, let's who's who's next? Let's, yeah, sounds great. Uh, Thanks keep a lot. Moving the train. Thank you. That kid's a ninth grader. I know he's got like a man's beard, but uh, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's just finishing ninth grade. Awesome. 
keep it up. All right, Argus. Um, Argus is our reigning top dog. He got into BUTI this summer and, of course, didn't get to go to Tanglewood. Yeah. Uh, just finished his GDYO audition. So where are you playing, man? I'm, I'm going to get out of here. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess I could do a number of things. I, uh, I have pretty much all of Till, all those excerpts. Uh, I have Beethoven in the front. Uh, I could do the expo to the Mozart second horn concerto. That, you should do that. So Mozart, great. Yeah. I'm sorry about, uh, sorry about BUTI. I, I yeah. <laughs> a few years and I love that place so much. Um, they do a, a really great job of making it just a really life-shaping experience for everyone. So I, I hope that you do get a chance to go. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's great. I love it. Uh, yeah, anyone who wants to have a great summer that will totally change your life and the way you think about music, do yeah. something like, like the UTI. It's great. Yeah. Hopefully, so congratulations on your acceptance. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully next summer I can, I can I'll strive for that one more time. Yeah. Um, were you going to play, uh, were you going to do the horn workshop or the wind ensemble or the orchestra or some combination of those things? Yeah, it was the uh, youth orchestra and the uh, horn workshop. Okay, great. Great. Yeah, yeah I, I did the horn workshop one year um, with Eric Rusk, who's just a oh, total nut. So he's great. Um, and I did the wind ensemble a couple of times at the orchestras. Yeah, really amazing. Um, so I, yeah, I hope you get a chance to do that. And, Congrats on being accepted. It's, it's, a, it's a great place. So, okay. Anyways, let's start. Thank you. Okay, all right. Hey, bravo. You held that trill too long, but other than that, <laughs> yeah, very good. It's okay. You can see the look in his eyes like, uh, he, he was supposed to stop this trill already. Okay. Oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> for somebody of Argus's level and, and other students who are interested in playing music as a career, can you tell them when they get to stop practicing Mozart, please? This was actually the first thing I was going to say. You got to learn to love Mozart because you will never not be playing Mozart as a horn player. Um, he wrote us a bunch of stuff and we play it all the time, um, which I think is, is a great thing. And, and um, I mean, a, a lot of horn players start working on Mozart pretty early on because we have the materials. Um, and 
in some in some ways that's a great thing because we have these masterworks that we get to learn when we're kids i mean mm. that's awesome um but it also means that sometimes and i know danielle talked about this that later on in your professional life i mean you play mozart concertos especially especially the expositions come up a lot in auditions um, and you do sometimes feel like when you pick up the horn that you have reverted back to your 15 year old self um, <laughs> because you've just been playing them for so long. Um, so I think it's great. I mean, you're working with a teacher who's going to keep you on your toes, make sure all the fundamentals are there and that you're learning everything properly so that that doesn't come back to bite you later down the road. Um, so yeah, you're, you're in good hands. So that's, that's good, but you will never ever stop playing Mozart. I have, two Mozart concertos on my music stand right <laughs> and one of them is the one you just played um <laughs> yeah so to that end um not only because we have to play Mozart a lot but because Mozart is just like there's so much there mm. there's so much wit and color and cheekiness and excitement and beauty and luxury and all of these things are in Mozart and everyone sort of has their really strong opinion about how Mozart goes. Um, my opinion is just sort of um, make it colorful and exciting and fun and have a variety. Um, mm. So that's that's one of the things I want to I want to mention. Also, I remember playing in this in a master class, and this was for Jamie Somerville, who's the principal horn in Boston. Hopefully, when you go to Rudy next year, you will get to meet him. If you haven't already. Um, and he was like, you're rushing in your rest. You need to, like, I'm going to make you stomp on the floor during rest when I was standing. So that was like kind of a, a little bit of a tricky maneuver. He's like, your rests aren't long enough. I was like, the orchestra in my head is rushing. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like um, sort of embedding the orchestral material in your head by listening to some, to some recordings can help mm. avoid any of those kind of tempo fluctuations, both in rest and in the times that you're playing. So I did notice a couple times, and this is my tendency as well, when I have fast notes, then I go real fast. Um, yeah. And when I go, go move back to slower material, I go too slow. So there were a couple times where I felt there was a little bit of that fluctuation, um, mm -hmm. which when you're playing by yourself, it's not that you can get away with it, but if you were playing with a bunch of violinists going, da, 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 it would be hard to do that. Um, right. So that's why I'm suggesting to just um, do some listening practice, have that to be a regular part of your preparation, because then you really have that sort of ingrained, that, con that constant motor rhythm going on behind you. Um, but, you know, that's a relatively easy fix. That's just time listening, time with a metronome, um, time playing metronome games. There's an app that I like to use where you can sort of program different um, meters and then you can have it be silenced for certain parts so I'll have it take off four beats and then be silent for three bars and then take off another beat and that's how I know like did I maintain time during those four measures so those kinds of games can make it more interesting than just playing with metronome just like clicking at you all day because that's really annoying. Um, so anyways um, let's talk about musical things um, so I, I mean, you obviously have a great command of the horn, so I'm not going to like tell you how to play the horn. You can already do that. Um, so this is more just to like generate some musical ideas. Um, everything that you did sounded wonderful, and it all sounded basically the same. Um, and I think I think that you know you can you can play the horn, so you can do anything. So do anything. Um, you know, there's a lot of room for, you know, sort of lightness of articulation, like even, um, okay, here goes my attempt to play something cold. This should be fun. Um, even just the opening line, I think there's just room for a little bit of lightness. Even just, just a little bit of air there. Um, I don't know, d differences in articulations and in note lengths and shapes, and there's just so much that you can do with it. And since you're going to be playing Mozart for the rest of your life, might as well make it interesting. Um, and I don't play the same way every time. Uh, I don't think that that's how Mozart works. Um, but I like to, 
I don't know, I like to futz around a little bit and see, see what I can do. Um, that was probably not super in time because I was worried about playing all the no, fast notes in the scale, but um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But you, you, you hopefully through my, you know, system here that you could hear that I was changing the way that I was leaning into some notes and changing the way that some articulations work to make something really sparkle and to be really light. Like there's a lot of sort of imagery that I'll, I didn't write it into this part, but I'll, I'll write in a lot of sort of adjectives or characters um, to sort of remind myself of my intentions because the way I play Mozart, it's almost a little bit um, like he has multiple personality disorder a little bit um, because it just changes between these different feelings um, like pretty quickly. Um, there's obviously like there's classical style and you don't want to you don't want to play Mozart like Strauss for example um, but within that classical style there's so much variety that that you can achieve um, and so I think that to me is sort of the only like, this is how you play Mozart. I'm like, make it entertaining. Um, right. Cause Mozart was an entertaining weirdo who wrote a lot of horn music. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe let's just do just that opening phrase. And I wanna, um, let's do all the way up to um, just because I, I wasn't totally convinced by some of that mid-register stuff. Bum, 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 mm -hmm. bum, bum, bum. It just didn't sound as comfortable as some of the notes around it. And that could have just been, again, condensed audio, et cetera. But um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. No, well. it wasn't. He can play it better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pa, you know, or ba on those notes, Argus. I say ba there. I go ba, ba, ba. Just mm -hmm. keeps you to nice. get everything to stick in and not go full up, full up, full up. Yeah, there can be a little full up and happen. So Molly, yeah. do you play that F trigger? I play that F trigger two and three. I'm on my B flat horn. I go ba, 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 and then I go ba, ba, ba. Nah, you don't I, do I just do it all on one. Um, and part of that is some of my, oh, I didn't mention, um, some of my background is learning. I spent a couple years learning natural horn while I was at Juilliard as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of that influences the way that I choose to play Mozart and other things that would be written for hand horn. Um, not that it's like a purity issue or anything, but because I spent a lot of time working on this stuff on one length of tubing, I'm okay keeping it on one length of tubing when I have valves. Um, it's just a little bit simpler for me and the intonation works out well enough on my horn that I can get away with it. Um, can you still play hand horn? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Um, the, <laughs> the first time I learned the Mozart um, quintet with two violas, or violin, two violas, and cello, I learned it on. Yeah, great. it's freaking hard. And um, it didn't sound that great, if I'm honest. Um, I did it on a recital. It was the year that my grandma had passed away and I just like had to do something. So I did that on the end of my recital and it was a little bit of a disaster. But, and then when I went and I had to learn it for something else, and I was like, this is way easier with valves, y'all. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, valves are our friends. Um, yeah, anyways, sorry, random tangent. Um, but also that in sort of informs the way that I think about some of the way that the harmonic stuff works with chords and what notes would be closed and what notes would be open. Um, so even just sort of a basic knowledge of what that would look like can shape how you do some of your phrasing and some of the colors that you choose to use. So anyways, um, okay, let's have you play and have me stop talking. <laughs> All right. So just more like, just try something new this time. Try something new. And if it like goes wildly off the rails, like that's fine. Okay. This is a good place to do that. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. 
yeah, good. So I, I get the sense already that you're just sort of opening up your sound a little bit more, which is great. Um, I think even though Mozart is, you know, it's like, sometimes it's marked piano and stuff. It's like, okay, fine, but you're the soloist, like play louder, it's fine. Um, but something that I, that caught my attention before, and again, condensed audio, it almost sounded like, um, it, it almost sounded like the way that you were playing it, that the, like, that the, the pinnacle of the whole, um, of the whole exposition was and I was like weird that's the first time you actually played kind of loud <laughs> it just seemed like a weird choice um but the way that you just played that now every everything had some sparkle everything was interesting everything you know it it just opened up a little bit and I think um I think that's a great direction to go I think you can do it even more so you could do like like there's so many shapes little shapes that that can really be interesting and that are not stylistically incorrect um i think i think sometimes we think well it's not strauss so it's got to be kind of flat and boring um, and I don't think that's true. So I think there's a lot of room for experimentation. It might mm. feel terrible. There might be some things that don't work and that's fine. Um, but try, try them and see. Um, and, you know, just because I played, you know, okay, this one was a little softer and this came out here. Next time I do it, I might do the total opposite of that. And it, that might work too. So there's, it's not exactly a blank canvas, but there's so, so much potential within these notes to do mm -hmm. things that you want to do. It's actually like pretty exciting. Um, I mean, you have mastery of the notes and now you get to make it you. Um, you, get to, you get to sing the way you want to sing. You get to you know, project the emotions that you want to project. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in, that, in that way, you are honoring what Mozart wrote because he made it possible for you to do that. Um, and so I think getting by, by um, sort of sh showing this, variety and depth of character that you are serving Mozart, um, which is, I mean, that's, that's a pretty exciting thing that we get to do. The ultimate goal is uh, to not serve the audience or the music, but the composer, you know, yeah. to, yeah. to know well enough. But Argus, what she's saying is so awesome. You're a guy that records your practice. So record yourself trying it one way and then experiment doing it a second way and then listen to them both and write some notes. Okay, I liked this, this didn't work. And like Mr. Vermeulen says, get into the lab, you know, be a researcher with this music, not just a horn player. Sure, uh -huh. yeah. And I mean, there, like some of the harmonic interest that happens is not as easily reflected in the, in the horn part. So that's another reason why listening to recordings can be really helpful so that you're hearing sort of where the changes are happening uh, in the orchestra parts to know like, okay, this is the function of this, this note is relating to like this interesting chord change over here. Um, because sometimes when you're playing the solo line, you, it, it doesn't necessarily indicate what's happening around you and what then makes that line even more interesting. Um, so it's sort of, it just feeds off of each other, what the orchestra is doing and what the soloist is doing um, to create something that's, that's more the, the, what is it? It's uh, greater than the sum of its parts, um, which is really hard to achieve when you're sitting in a room by yourself, for sure. But, but that's why what, what we're saying is that the experimentation you can do now, um, because then you know you have an arsenal of things that you like and that work well, and then you get to choose them in the moment, um, which is super fun. Um, slightly dangerous, which is what makes it fun. But um, <laughs> I'm not saying don't have a plan ever. <laughs> but allow yourself the flexibility and have, have done the work beforehand to have the flexibility to do things so that you can be part of what's happening around you and to create something together instead of like, here's how I like to play Mozart and then they're doing their own thing. So um, that's another reason to practice it a bunch of different ways so that you have those things in your arsenal. And this goes for kind of all music. Everything, yeah. 
I mean, Mozart is a great example of it because there is so much potential and so much variety, like more so than maybe Mahler or something. But even, you know, it, that's, that's why this subject comes up a lot with Mozart. Um, and it's a great introduction to all of us to sort of really experiment and like go, maybe go a little past the line and then bring it back in because you found where the line was. Um, <laughs> But so that that to me, that's like the Mozart rule is like make it interesting. Um, it's really so good. Yes. Um, we we got to keep moving, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. um, Sorry, I just but, talked most of the time. You sound great. No, this is perfect. <laughs> this is what we want. He doesn't need to play it a bunch of times. He knows how to play it. Um, <laughs> what I again, what I hear Miss Norcross saying is that we have to have a large breadth of vocabulary. And we have to know in Mozart how to say it different ways so that if the conversation around us is different, we are able to participate. Right. That was amazingly put. Thank you. <laughs> I try. So Argus, bravo, man. I mean, you're, you're sounding great. Etudes, 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 please. Yep. Um, right. Thank you, Ms. Norcross. Appreciate it. You sound great. Thank you. So we like to always wrap up with some easier, more casual stuff. Um, Ooh, okay. So first and foremost, equipment. What horn and mouthpiece do you play every day? And yeah. Um, it's funny. So one of my colleagues now in Cincinnati is like such a gearhead. He is so into equipment. And he comes <laughs> up to me and starts talking about equipment. And I'm like, Charlie, I don't know what you're talking about. This is so not my thing. Um, I do know what my horn is. It's just a nice Engelbert Schmidt double. Um, I've had this horn, I got it during my undergrad um, because my teachers felt like I needed to play with more colors and I needed an instrument that was gonna let me do that. Um, and so this is sort of where I landed and I've been super happy with it. Um, I have a last key mouthpiece. It's so a 75G. Um, I stole this, I didn't steal this. Mr. Purvis gave me this mouthpiece and never asked for it back. And I hope he never does because I'm still using it. Um, so I've stuck with this setup for a long time. Um, generally, I feel like any issues are me and it's not the horn's fault, but I did have to get my valves rebuilt because some of it actually was the horn's fault. So womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, that's what Kevin plays, and I think um, students that, as you look to go up a mouthpiece from uh, Holton Farkas MDC, Alaski 75G is a really good option. I mean, it's it's not going to break the bank, and it is, you know, I played Alaski forever until I, I switched to what I play now, which is a wind hogger, but... Okay. Um, you know, just you'll see in all of America's great symphony orchestras, quite a few Laskies plugged in. Yeah, yeah, they pop up a lot. They work nicely with these instruments. Um, yeah, for me, it was just a little bit of trial and error, just finding something that wasn't super different from what I had been using before, but that worked well with this instrument. And that's just what I landed on and I have stuck with it. So, yeah. Okay, so now some desert island. Um, you're trapped on a desert island and you can only bring one composer's complete catalog. Ooh. That is a tough one. Okay, well, last night I was listening to Rose and Cavalier, so I guess I'm going to have to say Strauss. <laughs> going to say Strauss again. Good. And Joe Ossie made a great point that folks, especially horn players, forget about all those operas. Dude, opera is where it's at. Right the now, Brown Shotson is like a piece people don't even know about, and it's incredible. Yeah, I was super lucky. Um, I got to play Ariadna of Naxos, which is sort of earlier in Strauss's operas, but post Electra, um, when he was going back to some like the more romantic style. It's gorgeous music, and I got to play it at Tanglewood. We were working with Christoph Nagnani, who just totally schooled us, and it was amazing. Um, and just because I have such a fond memory of going through that process and learning that piece, I just, I just love it. It's beautiful. Um, Rosen Cavalier is a gem. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff. And I also want to recommend, you know, in addition to listening to the great horn players, 
listen to great singers, listen to great violinists, like they all have, I mean, they're, they're incredible and just don't, just don't limit yourself because I think a lot of great horn playing is related to great singing. Um, so I really recommend listen to singers, listen to operas. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, again, another piece of advice that these students have now heard from every single clinician. You're number <laughs> 12 of 15 and all 11 before you have said the exact same thing about singing and singers and mimicry. And it is so important. People always ask me, is, is the horn a lot like the trumpet? And I always say, sure, but it's a lot more like singing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very close. Okay. So can you recommend one recording for the students to go look up? very specific recording that you love that sure. you can all here. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, um, last night, like I said, I was listening to, um, I was listening to Rosen Cavalier, but before that I was listening to the four last songs, um, sort of hearkening back to what we were talking about before with that amazing concert. It's gorgeous music, um, that includes both gorgeous singing and gorgeous horn playing. Um, and there are actually two that I really love. So I will, tell you both of them. Um, one is Elizabeth Schwarzkopf um, with the Berlin Radio Symphony and George Zell. Um, that's sort of like the old, the old classic. Um, it's with, uh, or no, is it with London? I don't know. Schwarzkopf. Um, and then sort of a totally different approach and also gorgeous is Jesse Norman. Um, and that's with Leipzig and Kurt Mazur. Um, Neither of them are like super recent recordings, um, but they're sort of like the this, this standbys, stands by, the standbys. I don't know how the plural works on that one. Um, Students, Jesse Norman is one of the biggest names in opera singing to ever walk the earth. And so, you know, yeah. you might not know that name now, but you will, you will run across it a lot. Yeah, she's, uh, she passed away recently. She, she was incredible. Um, I was lucky enough to hear her in the Dallas Symphony about four years ago or so. Oh, great. Yeah. Which and is, I mean, I like, it was five or six, but even before she opens her mouth, her stage presence, when she walks out there, it's like, like, you know, it's, it's like, it's like gravity, like bending space time. Like this woman just, just everything gets drawn to her. And then she opens her mouth and sings, and you're like, um, you know, that's the only person I've ever seen that has that same gravitas is uh, Augustin Hadelik. Yeah, he's wonderful. He walks on the stage, the whole room focuses like a laser. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he, yeah. So finally, um, and this is my favorite question, but also the hardest question of the day. Okay. Um, if you could go back to your eighth, ninth grade self and communicate some of the golden kernels that you've mm -hmm. learned. What are some of those things you would just sit down and tell yourself like, hey, eighth grade Molly, here's some of the things I've learned and you should try to do this now and not wait. Yeah, wow, that's a great, great question. Um, I think that, and this sort of goes back a little bit to things that we were talking about before, but the, the intertwined concept of believing that you are a valuable person in and of yourself, that you have something great to offer, therefore offer it, go for it and trust yourself. And those things are all related. And it's one thing to say them. It's, it's one thing to even say them to yourself if you don't really believe it. It takes time. Um, but it really does start with that core of that you are a valuable person in and of yourself. What you do on the horn is a great thing, but it is not you. Um, and so to really, to, to, to feel that just by being on the earth, you are enough. And that frees you to do a lot of great things to trust yourself and go for it. Um, that, uh, that might sound a little bit crazy. Like, come on. Um, uh, and I ha had someone told me that when I, when I was in eighth grade, I probably would have looked like them at them like they were a crazy person. So if you're looking at me like I'm a crazy person, I get it. Um, and you'll grow into it and maybe you'll remember this and realize 
yes, I am a valuable person and I can just go for it. I can trust myself. And that opens up so many doors. Um, so I hope that you will remember that even if it doesn't resonate with you right now. And there are days where it doesn't resonate with me now, even though I have come to believe that more and more. And I try to convince everyone I know that those things are true for themselves and for everyone. Um, I, yeah, it's sort of big advice. <laughs> it's a total shift of mindsets for, for a lot of people. I believe it's true. And I think that had I felt that as a younger student, I would have been able to go for things more and develop my playing more and believe in myself more as a player and as a person. Wow. Incredible. Can everybody turn their cameras back on so we can take a picture? Um, <laughs> Mr. Vermeulen always says, and it's on the wall, belief is the primary ingredient in success. Mm. Also Big preparation. <laughs> yes, and preparation. Okay. Hey, again, I want to just take a second to thank Molly Norcross for two hours of her time. I I don't know what to say except thank you so much. And uh, we just, we, we really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. And I'm so glad to see all of you here. Um, embrace the horn. It is your friend. It uh, is. All right. Jeez. Jeez. Perfect. Okay. Nice. So tomorrow. Dallas Symphony concert master Alex Carr will join us and coach members of the Greater North Texas Youth Orchestra. That's going to be 1 p.m. Central. This Friday, we have the incomparable Leelani Starrett from the New Leelani. York Philharmonic. We went to high school together. I am absolutely over the moon to have Molly and Leelani in the same week. Leelani is awesome. You guys will love her. Thank you so much, Molly. And yeah, uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, stay everyone. Safe yeah, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.